In the previous debugging video, we learned that the REPL is a powerful debugging tool, and we used it to debug and fix an issue in our web service. In this video, I'm going to show you a structured process which will help you leverage the REPL effectively for debugging. This process is called scientific debugging, or debugging with the scientific method. Before we get started, I just wanted to say that if you're having trouble following along or understanding something, or if you have a question, feel free to leave a comment on the video. I've also added links to other resources and community forums in the video description, so be sure to check those out as well. You can also ask questions and leave comments uh, in the other community forums. If you want to follow along with this video on your own computer, there's a link to the code in the description. Now let's move on to scientific debugging. The process of scientific debugging is simple. First, you form a hypothesis about the problem. What is a hypothesis? A hypothesis is an educated guess about what could be happening. So you have some information at hand. You might make a guess about uh, what the exact problem could be. And then you move on to step two, which is you test your hypothesis. You test to see if your guess is correct or not. And step number three, if the hypothesis is disproved by the test, you, you will have to start over from the beginning. You'll need to come up with a new hypothesis. And you just repeat this until eventually you arrive at the solution. This process works with pretty much any language and platform. Uh, you don't need Closure to do this. In fact, you may have already done this unconsciously with uh, other languages uh, or other tools. So what is it that sets Clojure apart? Well, thanks to the REPL, Clojure excels at step number two, testing the hypothesis. We can test our hypotheses very quickly by running code in the REPL or by using the REPL to change our running program. And this speeds up the overall debugging process tremendously. Now, let's apply the scientific debugging technique to a problem in our web service, which you may remember if you watched the previous video. Our web service serves a single API, which uh, just returns the name of a book given its ID. In the previous video, we'd fixed a bug in this API, but as you can see, if I issue another request, there's still a stack trace appearing in our REPL. Even though our API itself seems to be working just fine, it's giving us the correct name of the book. And it works for other IDs too. But why? Why is this stack trace still appearing? Let's see if we can come up with a hypothesis. We can apply the scientific debugging method here uh, to solve this problem. Hypotheses are formed on the basis of information about the problem and about the behavior of our program. We can get that information from a few different sources. We can number one, just look at the code. Right? We can just uh, you know look at the code and try to re read it and reason about what's going on. Uh, and form some kind of guess or hypothesis based on that. Number two is we can look at logs. Uh, so we can look at what is printed here, or if our application is in production and we have other tooling in place, uh, we can look at uh, other graphs or uh, observability tools. Number three, we have we can get information from previous hypotheses uh, that were maybe disproved. Even though they were disproved, that's still useful information. We now know that um, you know something was not the problem or something that is is, is not happening. Um, so you can use a previous hypothesis. Number four, uh, we can run code in the REPL. Uh, we can just run some code and uh, using the REPL, we can discover more about our program uh, and about its behavior and so on. These are just a few ways that we can gather information uh, to make a hypothesis. In our case, we have uh, some logs. We have the stack trace appearing right here. 
so we can use this stack trace to try to come up with a hypothesis. So it says response map is nil. So let's use that to make a hypothesis. Maybe it means uh, that our handler here is returning a nil response. I'm going to write that down. Our hypothesis Our handler, that is uh, fetch book name, is returning nil. Now we need to move on to the next step, which is to test the hypothesis. This is pretty easy to test. Our handler function returns the response, right? This is the function that returns the response. So we can just call it in the REPL and see what happens. So I'll say fetch, I'll switch to this namespace first and then say fetch book name. And let's give it the ID one. That looks like a valid ring response map. Let's give it some other ID. And so this, this is definitely not nil, right? Uh, it seems to be giving us a valid response map. Uh, and so I think this hypothesis has been falsified. We'll have to come up with a new one. So let's look at our code and the stack trace for some more ideas. We'll scroll back up here. And it looks like this stack trace is coming from ring jetty. You can see ring adapter jetty here and then there's more related stuff. And let's also take another look at our code. So this is where we're calling run jetty and we're giving it uh, this ring handler. And the ring handler is over here. So we're not actually passing fetch book name directly to uh, run jetty. We're putting it through some other functions and middleware first. <clears throat> so maybe these functions are the source of the problem. We can come up with a couple of new hypotheses. Hypothesis number one, if I'll just open the the namespace on the side here. The first hypothesis uh, could be that this uh, function might be returning a handler that's returning nil under certain circumstances. Biddy, biddy's make handler function returns a handler which is returning nil, right? And then the second function here is the wrap JSON response middleware. Um, and the middleware is just a function that accepts another ring handler and returns a new one. And in this case, this middleware, uh, what this is going to do is it's going to take the map, the map out of the response body here and uh, serialize it to JSON uh, and then associate the JSON string into the response. So the other problem could be that maybe this JSON middleware is returning a nil response. Maybe this is this is causing a problem, right? If if there's some kind of bug, uh, but it seems unlikely to me that the JSON middleware would cause a problem um, because this is supposed to be very straightforward. It just serializes things to JSON. Uh, so I think we should start by uh, checking the biddy, biddy middleware. And if there's no problem there, we'll move on to the JSON middleware. Now, how do we check this? Uh, if we could print a message uh, whenever this handler returns nil, well, then that would confirm our hypothesis. So how do we do that? Uh, one way to do it is we can add another middleware right in here. So let's call it wrap print nil. Uh, and what this middleware is going to do is it will call this handler, the handler that you pass to it. And if the response is nil, we're going to make it print out a message. 
So now let's implement wrap print nil. And a middleware is a function that takes a handler and it returns another ring handler. So that's a function that accepts a request and returns a response. Now in this case, let's let's call our handler uh, that was passed in with the request and then we can bind that to response. And now we can just check if the response is nil. If it's nil, uh, let's return uh, a response that maybe looks like this. Nil detected. And let's also print something out uh, to the REPL. Nil detect. And if it's not nil, then let's just res return the response unchanged. We don't want to mess with it in that case. And here's our middleware. Now let's restart uh, the server and test this. I'll just clear up the output here. We'll reissue the request. And would you look at that? We're getting, um, we're getting a nil detected, uh, you know, string printed here. So clearly this code path is being executed and uh, there was a nil response somewhere. Uh, but what's strange is that our API itself seems to be working just fine. Like we're still getting uh, the name foo JSON string uh, appearing correctly over here, works for the other ID as well. And we see the, the string has been printed uh, a couple more times. I'll refresh. So every single time I refresh, there's a new string being printed here. So now the question is, where is this nil response coming from? And another strange thing is we don't see this anywhere. Uh, our response body itself uh, isn't being rendered. I think this print, um, this is just coming from here. We can change this if we want uh, to be absolutely sure. This string is coming from here. I don't know where this went. Um, so we need to come up with a new hypothesis on the basis uh, of this information. It looks like uh, this has been proved to be correct. This is returning a handler which returns nil under some circumstances, uh, which we don't know about yet. So since this seems to be correct, I'm just going to ignore this for now. We'll have to come up with another hypothesis uh, because although this is useful, we still haven't arrived at our solution. So maybe there's another request uh, that is triggering this nil response. Maybe it's not uh, this get request. Maybe there's some request coming in from somewhere else. Uh, let's make that our second hypothesis. Uh, different request is triggering the nil response. We can test this by uh, printing out the request in our middleware. Let's um, take a look at the request and actually see where it's coming from. So I only want to print it if the response is nil. So I'm going to add We'll just print out the request here. Let's move that to go after the nil detected. We load, restart the server, clear this up. Let's reissue the request. And there we go, we have the request 
printed, uh, but this is really hard to read. So what I'm going to do is, I'll just make this an inline def instead. And let's restart again. We refresh. The request is still being printed, I think. Um, looks like I overwrote our uh, nil detected print instead of this, uh, but that's okay. There we go, uh, because we should still have uh, the star request var defined here. There we go, that's our request. Now let's take a closer look. So the request method is get, the body is uh, some object. I think this is some kind of stream, uh, but look at this. The URI is slash favicon.ico. This is the favicon. Uh, and the fav icon is actually the little icon that the browser displays over here uh, whenever you browse to a web page. So this must mean that our browser is actually issuing a request to get the fav icon so it can show it over here. Uh, and we can confirm this. Uh, and you know, just to be a little more formal about what we're doing, I'm going to write down a new hypothesis, which is that the browser is requesting the fav icon, which is triggering the nil response. We can test this by looking in the network tab. Now I'll refresh, and sure enough, we have uh, this request right here, which is the request to our API uh, URL, like we expect, but we also have this, which goes to slash favicon.ico. And this is actually giving us a 500 server error. Let's look at the response and look at that. The response um, is uh, our body that we've coded in here. So this is where that response is going. So. Um, in the beginning, I had assumed that the browser was making only one request. And so I was puzzled and I didn't know um, why this stack trace was being printed. But in the end, after all this debugging, that assumption was proven false. Now I leave it to you, the viewer, to fix the code to get rid of the stack trace. Remember, you can find the code in the video description um, if you want to you know, follow through and fix everything. I hope this explains the scientific debugging um, technique uh, a little more clearly. It's a structured process that you can use uh, to eventually arrive at an answer provided you spend enough time with it. And as you can see, the closure REPL makes it really easy to work with scientific debugging. For more information, you can watch Stuart Halloway's talk um, on debugging with the scientific method. It's a great talk and I highly recommend it, even if you don't write closure on a day-to-day -day basis. I leave a link to the talk in the video description. I hope you found this video helpful. Thanks for watching.